Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good Saturday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 14th of June. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your very latest weather information with your NOAA weather radio or simply by going to our website at weather.gov slash Alaska or head to arh.noaa.gov. They'll take you to the same place. The weather info line also has similar forecast information at 1-800-472-0391. Find each Weather Service office in Alaska on Twitter, NWS Anchorage, NWS Fairbanks, and NWS Juneau will get you there. On Facebook, U.S. National Weather Service Alaska is found at NWS Alaska. The address got a little bit shorter, so if you've got it bookmarked, you might want to check your bookmark and make sure you go to the right spot if you haven't been there recently. And on YouTube in the afternoon, on the Fairbanks and Anchorage channels now, you can get your daily afternoon map briefing. Simply go to YouTube, and in the search bar there, type in NWS Anchorage or NWS Fairbanks, and you can get your uh, full broadcast of this. If you're out to sea and you, know, you missed the show by a few minutes, you can watch the whole thing on alaskapublic.org or on YouTube simply by searching AKWX-TV. Again, that's the full broadcast of what you're seeing here tonight. Here's a look at the hazardous weather situation. The fire conditions in the northern parts of the interior and the south-facing slopes of the Brooks Range are pretty dry. The fuels there are uh, running on the very dry side at this point, and with strong and gusty winds at least through 10 o'clock, red flag warnings continue in these regions shaded in red at least through tonight. There's been thunderstorm activity today over the, uh, the fire there running around uh, the Fort Greeley area and the 100-mile fire. Uh, so uh, again, uh, we're going to watch for some erratic winds in that area, but uh, again, the, the worst conditions right now, mainly just a little bit to the north. Here's the bigger uh, picture there with the fire danger. You can see the extreme region has increased a little bit. The drier fuels now kind of uh, showing up a little bit more now with the lack of really solid rain. We've had some showers in the region. We've had a couple thunderstorms in the region, but nothing really good and soaking and wetting, which is really what's needed. Several days of that to kind of tamp that down just a little bit. We also have some high fire danger conditions starting to show up around the upper Kuskokwim Valley and mainly north of the Alaska Range and also to the west of Glen Allen. You can see though that days of wetter air, cooler weather and even some rainfall across south central has eased fire conditions somewhat across the Matanuska and Susitna Valleys and along the Kenai Peninsula and throughout the Anchorage Bowl and Kodiak. So as long as that continues, that's a good trend. Hopefully we'll get some more rain a little bit further northward in the coming weeks. Here's a look at the satellite picture out across the bearing now and several connections to Pacific moisture are picked out fairly easily. You can see one of those streaming into the Gulf. Another circulation across the uh, Bering Sea is uh, really not connected to any major moisture stream right now, but you've got another one shaping up here across eastern parts of Asia. One more look up to the north and you can see northerly flow coming down through the Bering Strait, wrapping into the back side of the circulation across the southern and eastern sections of the Bering Sea. Looking closer to the continent, you'll notice on the visible satellite picture here more of an actual snapshot of the clouds as we saw them from space today. Uh, some low clouds across the interior, but a lot of sunshine popping out there, so we're going to expect to see some pretty warm temperatures when we check those readings here in just a few minutes. Low pressure that crossed the Gulf now is really starting to far, fall apart. The frontal boundary that was working into southeast really on its last legs at this point, so probably by tonight or tomorrow. If it's not gone already, it will be gone. The moisture working in here is also falling apart. A lot of that has been shunted well to the south and heading for the Pacific Northwest. Across the interior of the Yukon, you can see thunderstorms developing here. Some of those reaching into and across the Alcan border. Some of those also west of Fairbanks by late afternoon. We saw some more clouds running down the lower and middle Yukon. And here's another circulation. Low pressure working across the central and western chain, starting to move more wind and probably some precipitation into the southern Bering Sea. This will add another round of rainfall to south and western Alaska and south central in the coming days. Meanwhile, uh, more of what you see across the north with dry weather, that's not helping the fire conditions as we just saw for areas north of Fairbanks, Fort Yukon, and Arctic Village. High pressure uh, locking in some low clouds and maybe a little bit of light rain across the Arctic Coast Lake this afternoon. 
Also, another circulation across the central chain at 1,008 millibars, showing some light rainfall there across the central chain and farther south into the North Pacific. Low pressure across the eastern Gulf is probably about as low as it's going to get before it starts to fill in quickly tonight and tomorrow. That's down to about 997 millibars. The occluded front again this afternoon analyzed all the way down toward uh, the Pacific Northwest. But as we get into the afternoon tonight, uh, it's probably going to start to fall apart fairly quickly. So uh, some changes in the wind direction tonight and into tomorrow. But after that, that frontal structure is probably done. Look for showers across the region as we head into south central and across the interior tonight. High pressure across Barrow will lock in some lower clouds across the Beaufort and the Chukchi Sea coast. Low pressure around Adak and Atka will keep more of an easterly flow moving through the St. Paul and the Pribilof Islands. Some light rain and drizzles possible there. A much drier situation for the YK as we go through tonight. And the next best chance for any precipitation starting to show up across the southern and western parts of the Gulf and the North Pacific. And don't be fooled, there's a cold front coming across the eastern parts of Siberia. But as we've seen with recent patterns, this should be very slow to move out to sea. And once it does, chances are it'll drop southward very quickly, just like our last uh, round of low pressure did, which is what you see there at 1,008 millibars. By Sunday, you can see the cold air advancing ever so slightly to the west. A trough of low pressure lies across the Alaska Peninsula, or, or the Alaska Range, I should say, and up into the Chukchi Sea coast. And along that boundary, we should expect to see some showers and storms scattered across the interior for Sunday afternoon. There will be uh, ample areas of dry air across the upper Yukon, including Fort Yukon and Arctic Village, again, uh, probably exacerbating the fire conditions there. And showers, maybe a thunderstorm possible across uh, the Denali region, the upper Kuskokwim, and probably the middle Yukon Valleys, with a few showers across the YK and Norton Sound. Most of the wet weather will be uh, concentrated across the southern third of the state, with a better chance for rain showers across southeast, though some parts of northern southeast will see a drier day than what you've seen today. And remember, we were talking about the next surge of wetter air coming up from the Gulf of Alaska. Now that's slowly working its way northward there. You can see the warm front approaching now. Now, and low pressure continues to dawdle out across the central Aleutians at 1,009 millibars with areas of fog, drizzle, and maybe some light rain associated with that. As we get into Monday, you'll notice the trough of low pressure still sitting in its same place across the interior in the west coast and the Seward Peninsula. A few showers there from St. Lawrence Island down through the Pribilovs and across the Alaska Peninsula. The circulation over the Aleutians is now just south of the Kodiak Island region. It's 1,000 millibars, and that next surge of moisture is slowly working northward. Once it does, though, it's probably going to tighten up just a little bit more, so we should expect some higher winds with this and probably a better surge of uh, rainfall across coastal areas, including Kodiak Island and the Kenai Peninsula, and maybe even the Matanuska and Susitna Valleys as we head into Monday. A scattering of showers and storms across the Yukon and British Columbia, probably some of those stretching west across the Alcan as well, uh, many of those reaching into the upper Yukon Valley and perhaps adding some rain without a whole lot of lightning, we hope, out across the northern uh, flats there around Fort Yukon and Arctic Village. Here's a look at temperatures today. As we were talking about in southeast, uh, the wetter day for many uh, places around Juneau uh, dipped into the lower 50s. For southern parts of southeast, low to mid 50s. They're higher, even cooler at 59 degrees. High to Gwaii at 50 degrees. Coastal areas a little bit closer to the 50 degree mark with Gustavus at 46. Yakutat was 54 degrees. Haines and Skagway also in the mid 50s. Prince William Sound saw temperatures in the lower 50s. If you're in Valdez, Cordova was 59, 50 in Seward. Homer 55, or 56 I should say, 55 in Middleton Island, 57 in Kenai, and 58 around Anchorage with Talkeetna showing lower 60s. Glen Allen was 55, and where the sun was out, temperatures soared into the lower 70s for Tanana and Fairbanks today. Eagle and Northway in the upper 50s, and even upper 60s there if you look at Eagle alone. About the same there around Fort Yukon, again, where it was very dry. Uh, places like uh, Tanana and Northward were uh, fairly dry throughout the day. We did see a few thunderstorms trying to pop up here, probably around the McGrath area and Northward. 55 around Arctic Village, 57 in Anaktuvik Pass, 40s for Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse, with 38 around Kaktovik, 31 in Barrow. Uh, Temps and Kotzebue Sound ranged from 36 in Shishmaref to 59 in Kivalina, 40s if you're a little bit closer to land in Red Dog Mine, 51 degrees around Nome. Unilakleet was showing 50 degrees by late afternoon. Bethel was only 47, though, with St. Lawrence Island at 36. McGrath, 61. And down the Kuskokwim, we saw temperatures jump into uh, the 50s for the most part. 40s, 50s, and 60s once you're in Bristol Bay. Dillingham, a milder 61 degrees with Lake Iliamna in the uh, 60s, it looks like. 
Uh, 40s, 50s, and may, yeah, looks like mainly 40s and 50s today for most of the Alaska Peninsula with Kodiak at 63. Dutch Harbor in Alaska was 49. St. Paul, 46. About the same there as Adak, and Shemia was reporting 43 by 4 o'clock this afternoon. Southeast low temperatures tonight will be fairly mild in the mid to upper 40s. There are some places closer to 50 around Haines and Skagway. Yakutat about 43, about the same as what you'll find in Prince William Sound. South Central is looking at overnight lows in the upper 40s with uh, Kodiak looking at 47. Most of the Aleutians in the mid to upper 40s there as you look at Bethel, 40 degrees, 37 in Nunavak Island, 40 in Nome. Around Fairbanks expect a low around 48 degrees with many areas around town and outside of the Tanana Valley, probably in the mid 40s, a little bit cooler there. 37 in Anaktuvik Pass and the Arctic Coast looking at temperatures for the most part at or below freezing from Barrow about 28. High temperatures tomorrow there back in the mid 30s. A few areas closing in on 40 degrees like Wainwright, Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse probably closer to 45, Kaktovik 40 degrees. And look at the interior, another mild if not very warm day, lower 70s there. And with a little bit of moisture, that could certainly spark a few more showers and storms there. So expect a scattering of convective activity throughout the day. Upper 50s for Prince William Sound. South Central could be as warm as the lower 60s in Talkeetan and Kodiak Island, 58 degrees. Lower 50s for the Alaska Peninsula, although the Bering side could be a little bit cooler. Look at Pilot Point and Port Hyden, probably upper 40s for you. About the same there in St. Paul in the central and western chain, also looking at mid to upper 40s. Southeast, we'll see temperatures at or just below that 60 degree mark. Juno's looking at 59, Sitka 57. Uh, Haines and Skagway, probably 59 degrees. Catch Can and Annette, a little bit closer to the mid 50s for you. Uh, so, all in all, a little bit of a warmer day for many in the interior, even southeast and south central as we get into your Sunday. On to flying weather now, you'll notice a wide swath of IFR conditions across uh, the Gulf of Alaska, mainly in the central and eastern side. Uh, for southern parts of southeast, you're looking at MVFR conditions. Watch for thunderstorms to develop mainly north of the Alaska Range and south of the Brooks Range tomorrow in the middle and upper Yukon Valley and Tanana areas. Uh, to the west, you can expect a wide swath of IFR conditions from the Gulf of Anadir, south of Nunavak Island, and westward toward the western chain with pockets of IFR across the central chain and then south of the eastern parts of the chain, MVFR, in parts of Bristol Bay and the Alaska Peninsula. Here's your pass conditions. Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass, we expect to be VFR for your Sunday. As we get into Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, expect marginal conditions throughout the day. Rainy Pass should see some improvements as you go. Windy Pass, we expect to see scattered conditions uh, throughout your Sunday. Isabel Pass, uh, probably scattered thunderstorms developing in the afternoon. VFR conditions there. And for Windy Pass, as I mentioned, Mentasta Pass, MVFR trending toward VFR conditions. We'll watch for thunderstorms there as well. Tanita Pass, we're expecting VFR conditions to improve to VFR again throughout the afternoon. Portage Pass, MVFR trending toward VFR conditions through your Sunday. And Chilkoot and White Pass, compared to today, tomorrow should be a better day at VFR through most of your Sunday. Freezing levels indicate that warm air is still sitting across eastern parts of Alaska. However, that cold air is dropping southward a little bit more across the Brooks Range. Freezing levels change very quickly from 2 to 4, even 6,000 feet. We still have a pocket of cold air here sitting just west of the YK Delta over Nunavak Island and out towards St. Matthew. And between 2 and 4,000 feet heading toward Unalaska and Dutch Harbor over the Privlovs and the southern tip of the Alaska Peninsula. Icing potential is present, but a lot of that's fairly high up there, between 8 and 12,000 feet. West of the Alaska Range will also have the opportunity for uh, icing potential around and near thunderstorm activity should that develop across the eastern Copper River Basin and out across areas just west of Yakutat and the northern Gulf. Across the Bering, we'll expect a freezing levels uh, and the moisture to combine to produce uh, maybe a light to isolated moderate icing threat, generally above 5,000 feet to below about 10,000 feet. Looking at the jet stream potential, the pattern here, if you look at the satellite picture, this lines up very, very nicely. You have one major circulation here across the southern Bering Sea in North Pacific and another across the northern parts of British Columbia. This pattern is producing a ridge of high pressure across the North Pacific, and this is latching onto that Pacific moisture and guiding it right into south central and southwestern Alaska with an added bonus, a little bit of a jet streak here coming in across the Arctic coast. That is keeping a lot of uh, that storm development activity right here across the interior, but it's also locking in a lot of dry areas. Most of that moisture doesn't seem to be making it that far north. 9,000 feet, winds are fairly light across the interior, no issue there at all. We have more of a west and southwesterly flow across the Chukchi Sea coast. The strongest winds at this level are racing across the Gulf of Alaska, mainly south of the coast itself around 
uh, 40 to about 50 knots. Winds are pretty light across southeast from the west and northwest, only around 10 knots. And our weak circulation here across the Aleutians running around 10, 15, maybe as high as 20 knots from the north across the western part of the chain. At 3,000 feet, winds continue to be really light across the interior, only 5 to 10 knots there. A westerly flow a little bit lighter across the central gulf. The further south you go, the winds pick up there a little bit closer to that 50 knot reading we saw higher up at 9,000 feet. Here's our circulation, bending winds around in a counterclockwise motion as they do in the northern hemisphere. 15 to about 25 knots there coming in from the north and northeast, west of the Pribilovs, and high pressure slowing things down across Norton Sound and parts of the west coast with a little bit of a trough showing up where we've got our cold air digging into the eastern Siberia. Here's our winds coming in from the south and west around 20 to 25 knots. Winds pretty light across the Beaufort Sea coast and also across the eastern interior. So what about turbulence? Generally below 2,000 feet for the Arctic coast. We expect to see a little bit of chop tomorrow along that frontal boundary and right along the uh, eastern Russian coast. Uh, probably some light to isolated moderate and across the central chain closer to that area of low pressure below 2,000 feet. But other than that, I really don't see any major focus uh, for gap flows or uh, very strong wind shear or wind patterns at this point. Uh, one exception, of course, as always, we want to point out possible turbulence with, uh, in the vicinity of any scattered thunderstorms. For, so watch for that development in the afternoon tomorrow, but mainly north of the Alaska Range and south of the Brooks Range. That's a look at your aviation forecast. I'll be back in just a few minutes with your marine weather. Stay tuned. The beach on the southeast side of Montague Island stretches for nearly 80 miles of pristine wilderness. At least it looks pristine from a few thousand feet up. As our helicopter descends towards the shore, big chunks of white styrofoam come yeah, into you view. See all the big globs of styrofoam? That's all tsunami debris. Yeah, there's definitely, there, there are more, there's more styrofoam out here. There's no question. Chris Pallister would know. He's president of the nonprofit Gulf of Alaska Keeper. The group has been cleaning up marine debris that washes onto Alaska's shores for 11 years. And when the tsunami debris began arriving last spring, their job got a whole lot harder. Pallister has visited Montague Island nearly a dozen times since then. And by the time we land and step onto the pebble beach, he's shaking his head in disgust. I mean, you're basically standing in a landfill out here. Pallister points to an area scattered with styrofoam bits smaller than packing peanuts. So you see what's happening here with all the crushed up styrofoam now? This is what we're worried about. This styrofoam's just going to get all ground up. And you can see there's just be billions, trillions of little bits of styrofoam scattered all over everything. The smaller it gets, the more concerning it is. The smaller it gets little pieces like this, it's virtually impossible to clean it up. I mean, to clean this up right here, you have to take out all this organic matter with it and, you know, extrapolate that all up and down this coast, coastline. It's kind of an impossible job. The trash is not just an eyesore. Pallister says voles, birds, and even bears are eating the styrofoam and plastic. He's also worried about chemicals. Among the debris, he finds containers that held kerosene, gas, and other petroleum products. Even the little containers worry him. Sifting through the trash, he picks up a small blue bottle and unscrews the cap to inspect its contents. I have no idea what this was. It looks like just dish soap, maybe, laundry detergent, but it's uh, empty, <laughs> which is maybe not a good sign. But there's thousands of bottles like this all up and down the coast from small household chemical items to uh, drums full of chemicals, big industrial sized drums. Marine debris is not a new issue in Alaska, but the Japanese tsunami has magnified the problem many times over. Pallister says the tsunami debris doesn't have the visceral impact of the Exxon Valdez spill with oiled animals and blackened coastlines, but he thinks in the long run it could be a bigger environmental disaster. In a lot of ways it's a lot worse than the oil spill both in the geographic scope of it and the chemicals that are coming with it. And who knows what the impacts are gonna be. And they're gonna be really difficult to measure because they're spread out spatially. And, you know, it's gonna be a very difficult scientific issue to sort that all out, I think. 
Officially, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has only recorded 20 tsunami debris items that have landed in Alaska, but the agency will only confirm an object if it has a unique identifier that can be traced back to Japan. The state of Alaska does not use the same strict standard. Last summer, the state paid for an aerial survey to inspect 2,500 miles of Alaska's coastline. Elaine Bussey Floyd is acting director of the Division of Environmental Health. She says the survey identified tsunami debris all along the flight path from southern southeast up to Prince William Sound and out the Alaska Peninsula. There was tsunami debris literally on on every beach that was that was photographed we took they took over 8,000 pictures and it was more widespread and greater quantities than than we even expected but so far there has been minimal funding for cleaning up the debris governor sean parnell didn't include any tsunami debris funding in his budget noaa is figuring out how to distribute a five million dollar gift from japan and Alaska's congressional delegation is working to get federal funds. But tsunami debris cleanup money was stripped from a bill for Hurricane Sandy relief that passed this week. Look at this mess here. Back on the beach, as the waves crash in, Chris Pallister says the debris could have serious impacts on fisheries and subsistence resources. I don't know if it's being taken seriously enough. I don't think a lot of people that are going to be impacted by it know how bad it is right now. Um, and until that gets out, Maybe not much is going to happen, but I, I think that I think the, we're kind of getting to the tipping point now where a lot of people in the state and federal agencies realize the gravity of this situation and, and they're all working pretty hard now to get a handle on the scope of the problem and trying to develop funding uh, sources. But as of yet, that hasn't happened, but it's a huge problem. It's going to take years to clean this mess up. Pallister guesses it will take tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars to remove the debris. On this day, though, he has to leave it all on the island. All right, we better go back. Okay. We take off in the helicopter and head north along the beach. Pallister looks out the window at all the debris below and says it just goes on and on and on. On Montague Island, I'm Annie Fight. Thanks so much, Annie. Here's a look at southeast forecast as we get into your Sunday. Winds are going to be diminishing in just about all areas over what you saw today. A north and northwesterly flow for most of the coastline from Gustavus southward toward the southern entrances. More of an onshore flow closer to Craig and the Dixon entrance. A southeasterly flow in the inner waterways as high as 20 knots. A four foot sea expected there. Winds should be pretty light from the south across the Lynn Canal. As we get into Monday, a west and northwesterly flow picks back up again, mainly south of Sitka. It could run anywhere from 15 to about 30 knots with five to six foot seas. Four foot seas there around Gustavus in the northern entrance. More of a southerly flow around Yakutat with a four foot sea and 15 knot winds. Southerlies remain light across the north and south Lynn Canal. More of a northwesterly flow south of Juneau to Petersburg and in toward Ketchikan and Metlakatla. You're looking at 15 knots there with about a three foot sea for Monday. Across south central, winds become variable inside of Prince William Sound. A two foot sea is expected there for Sunday. Southeasterlies outside of the sound coming into Middleton Island around 15 knots with a five foot sea. Westerlies coming off of the Kenai Peninsula and over the Barren Islands. Now west of the islands, that could be as strong as 25 knots with a seven foot sea. But once you get out into the Gulf, you're looking at 20 knots with a six foot sea all the way from uh, Seward and Resurrection Bay southward toward Kodiak. Inside of Shelikov Strait, a southwesterly flow with a six foot sea is expected there. And look for a southerlies coming up to Cook Inlet about 15 to 20 knots. They'll pick up speed a little bit more north of Kenai toward Anchorage with a three to four foot sea there. By Monday, winds become variable on the northern end of the inlet. More of an east and southeasterly flow from Kenai down toward the Barrens and across Shelikov Strait. Uh, you'll see about a four to five foot sea there from the Barrens and into Shelikov Strait. Uh, two foot seas once you get north of Homer. And then a south and easterly flow from Seward to Homer into the Barren Islands and more of a four to five foot sea in the western and northern Gulf. Inside Prince William Sound, that's a light easterly flow with a two foot sea on Monday. Across the Alaska Peninsula, expect variable winds to develop during the day on Sunday, mainly north of Cold Bay and south of Sand Point and King Cove. You're looking at two to four foot seas there. Across Bristol Bay, a westerly onshore flow with a four foot sea and more of a northwesterly flow around Chignik and uh, south of Kodiak Island with a five foot sea in the northern Pacific. Winds are going to shift around a little bit more on Monday. Expect more of an east and northeasterly wind to develop across the North Pacific with a four to five foot sea there and two foot seas in the bearing with 10 to 15 knot winds. Again, a generally light day as we head into Monday in the bearing. 
across Sunday uh, in the Aleutians. You're looking at a variable flow north of Unalaska and Nikolsky, also south of the eastern chain, up to 20 knots, so with a four foot sea. Winds are going to be shifting around here thanks to low pressure slowly tracking eastward here. A southeasterly flow north and west of Nikolsky, northerly is north of Adak and Atka on the south side of the chain. That's more of a southwesterly flow up to 15 knots. And north and northwesterly winds across the west and central parts of the chain with seas as high as six to seven feet. You'll see that westerly push develop throughout the day on Monday. 15 to 20 knot winds there with five to six foot seas across the west. And then here come the north and westerly winds kicking in once again for the central and eastern chain. Four to five foot seas on the Bering side and five to six foot seas on the Pacific side for Monday. Across the west coast, expect a variable flow north of Nunavak Island. Northwesterlies continue for St. Lawrence Island and St. Matthew Island. Light northeasterly flow for the Pribilovs in the upper Kuskokwim Bay. That's a northwesterly wind, 15 knots with a three foot sea. A little bit of a shift here on Monday. Westerlies across St. Matthew. Southwesterlies now for St. Lawrence Island heading into Norton Sound. And northerlies for St. Paul and St. George. Looking at three foot seas there on a 15 knot wind as you head into Monday. On the Arctic coast now, an east and northeasterly flow will be the rule for the Beaufort Sea Coast both Sunday and Monday. Look for easterlies a little bit stronger there from Wainwright down to Point Lay. A southerly flow off of Point Hope and Cape Lisbon and northwesterlies coming into Kotzebue Sound with a three-foot sea. By Monday, you can see the winds picking up now for Beaufort Sea, uh, the Beaufort Sea Coast with up to 20 knots there from Kaktovik to Barrow. More of a southerly flow off of Point Lay and Wainwright and more of a westerly flow for Cape Lisbon and Point Hope and southerlies back in Kotzebue Sound with 15 knots there and a three foot sea. Let's recap tonight's weather. Expect a trough of low pressure across the interior to create at least a chance for an isolated shower or storm, mainly north of the Alaska Range uh, into the middle of Yukon Valley and probably closer to the Alcam. Our frontal boundary is dying off across southeastern Alaska. That'll keep the risk of some light rain continuing there, but things should be slightly drier tomorrow and again on Monday. Look for areas of light rain and some drizzle across the central uh, Aleutians and into the southern Bering Sea. More areas will see more clouds and fog than any precipitation it looks like at this point. By Sunday, colder air is trying to move across the Bering Strait. It's going to take its own sweet time with showers and thunderstorms scattered across the interior. Once again, rain is subsiding in southeast and showers will still be possible across south central. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.